Well, now to the second sermon in our Advent series this Christmas, the gift of all gifts, who is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And since I'm saying he's the gift of all gifts, he's, he's better than anything else that we could name. There's, he's certainly better than some of, the, some of the idols that we tend to hold on to around Christmas time and at other times in our lives as well. And this morning we're going to speak on why Jesus is better than consumerism. Why Jesus is better than consumerism. And this might sound like kind of a nitty-gritty sermon, but it's a real issue. And if we don't speak to real issues in our preaching, what are we speaking about? Now, Americans, I know it, you know it. This, This is the way we are, okay? We're all about making a buck. We're all about making a buck. And we can do it pretty darn well, actually. Pretty darn well. Earning-wise, income, family, national GDP. We can do that pretty well, actually. (laughs) And why do we want to make that buck? Why do you want to make that buck? So that we can spend it, baby, right? So that we can spend it. You know what I mean? And that's part of what makes the economy turn around, right, and rev up like an engine. You know, gas goes in, exhaust comes out. Uh, consumerism fuels the economy of production and all those kind of things. And there's a positive aspect to consumerism. When you look at the, defini- the, the dictionary definition, it can have a positive aspect or it can also have a negative aspect. And obviously this morning I'm not talking about a positive aspect, basic econ- e- economics, so to speak. But I'm going to talk about the negative aspect, the, the idolatrous aspect <laughs> Or we can, be, we can be so wrapped up in this that it actually begins to take away from our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the derogatory meaning as one dictionary defines consumerism. Quote, the preoccupation of society with the acquisition of consumer goods. Preoccupied with goods, but not the good above all goods, which is Christ and His Word. He is the good above all goods. Classical philosophers would talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful in life. And it was sort of their naturalistic perspective of talking about something that everyone could recognize. Everyone could recognize that a healthy marriage was a good thing. Everyone could recognize that making some money and providing for your family was a good thing. People could look at wonderful works of art and say there's there's really an objective beauty there or a magnificent um, work of architecture, a temple or a government building, and say, there's a real beauty to that. People could likewise talk back and forth and agree on common things they felt were true. But this idea of the good, and of goods, of getting goods, (laughs) is always, always subject to going after together the good above all goods, which is Christ. And so even around Christmas time, there's sometimes a trap that people fall into where uh, you're shopping at the mall, you know what I mean? You're going to do some Christmas shopping and you get 10 presents for 10 different people and you also get 10 presents for yourself while you're at it. And, um, you know, it's a time, again, it drives the economy, right? December's a great month for, you know, Black Friday on, right? But at the same time, listen, beloved, we can have an, we can have an idol in this. And this can happen year-round, actually. There can be uh, something that pervades our hearts that makes us try to seek comfort or advancement in life from material goods. And it's not going to do what we thought it would do. It's going to let us down in the end. Why is that? Because John tells us that the things of the world are passing away. Both the neutral, just the goods, literally and physically, but also the lust for those things is also passing away. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever.
forever. There is, there is something eternal to be had and to be done. But it's not what John calls the world, which by that he means the world of evil. The world of evil that is all around us. And even the physical things that perhaps, you know, there's something just neutral about um, a Christmas cookie or a new watch, right? It's not evil in itself. But we can, we can lust after it and use it in an evil way, right? So that's why he, he talks about the, the love of the world, the desires of the flesh, you want to satisfy the flesh, the desires of the eyes, coveting after things. The pride of life is kind of like the rich man who, who looks out over his property and his businesses, and he says, hmm, look what I have done. Look what I have done. And he is, and perhaps in the worst of all, he is puffed up because of his material possessions, and because of his situation in life. You see, we were never meant to love things. There's a saying that says this, um, we, we have a tendency to love things and use people, even though you were meant to love people and use things, right? That's just a natural tendency that we all have in our sinful nature, that you're not, you weren't supposed to love things. You know, you might look at something, you might look at a tree and say, that's beautiful, but you were ne- never meant to love it for itself, to love physical things. We were meant to love other people. The Bible commands us to do that. Love your neighbor as yourself, you know, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you'll find many commandments in the scriptures about such things. But you'll never find a commandment to love things, to love things. And what happens is when we begin to love things in an ultimate way, even worship them, the Bible calls that idolatry. We can lift up all sorts of other things before the Lord. And so that's what John, John is warning Christians against here. You can't love the world of evil and love God at the same time. We have to be ready to surrender all to Christ. You know, if Jesus came to your door late at night and he told you not even to pack a bag, but to follow him because he had a mission for you, you must be willing to leave all and follow him at any cost. At any cost. And that is a way of thinking, just challenging your thinking a little bit of, you know, what are you, what are you not willing to give up? What are you not willing to surrender before the Lord? Now, I'll readily confess to you, listen, it takes one to know one, okay? <laughs> it takes one to know one, okay? I like my gadgets. I'm a sucker for new technology. You know, I'm, I'm of the philosophy that you should buy one that lasts 10 years versus four that lasts two and a half years each. But, you know, listen, I, I know how to tell myself all the excuses, right? Yeah, especially at Christmas time. You know, I know, I know how to do this. That it's over, it's okay to overindulge. But we must enjoy all good things in moderation. And we must put down completely the things that lead us away from Christ. We must put down completely the things that lead us away from Christ. And we must always enjoy Christ above all things. And that's a good test to go through your life. You're like, what's my favorite day of the week? What's my favorite time of the day? What's my favorite thing? I mean, like literally, just just very innocently ask yourself that question. What do you enjoy the most in your life? You know, what do you enjoy the most? There's not sort of a simplistic answer here. You know, I mean, yes, if it was Sunday school and you were five, you would raise your hand and say God or Jesus or the Bible, okay? But the point is, A, look at the things that, that are not related to God at all, or maybe even against God, and, and look at the things that are the things of God, the things from above. You know, His kingdom, His church, His worship, His word, His <laughs> fill in the blank. Is it related to God or not? The things that you enjoy most in life. That's the principle that the Bible is over and over again trying to teach us. <laughs> that he would be Abraham's treasure and great reward, right? Is he your treasure and your great reward? I was recently teaching my kids the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is man's chief end? In other words, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> you don't have to wait to college to get the answer to that question. 
You just get it in the catechism. What is man's chief end? What's, what's the whole point of why we're here? <laughs> man's chief end, it says, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Enjoy Him forever. That's it. It's pretty simple, actually. But why do we miss that? Why do we go to church and kind of have this religious angle to our lives, but we really enjoy other things? There's something wrong with our Christianity if Christ is not the number one thing that you enjoy. You enjoy spending time with Him, enjoy worshiping Him, enjoy reading His Word, enjoy sharing Him with others. You know, and others can see that joy in your life. They can see the joy of Christ in your eyes, right? And they kind of they maybe notice something or they even ask about it. It's pretty easy to tell from the outside, actually, what somebody really enjoys, where they find their satisfaction, you know? We can just look at the bank transactions. We can look at the, you know, look at your house. We can look at, you know, whatever, <clears throat> the way you take a log of your time, the way you spend your time. If everything's laid out, and it's not laid out before anyone, but it's laid out before God, right? <laughs> he does actually see all those things. And he can tell what we, what we value. And here's the answer. What sort of John is describing negatively the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, that covetousness, I want, I want, I want, and the pride of life, I have, I have, I have, look at me. He, he describes the negative, don't love the world or the things of the world or the lusts of the world. All this stuff is passing away. But we go back to our original passage in Revelation and Jesus once again is now going to give you the answer. <laughs> He's going to say, okay, not that, <laughs> but this. Not that, but this. Revelation three seventeen. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. The call of the gospel and the response and repentance and faith is very valid for you as a believer. It's every bit as valid for you as a non-believer. This is what you need to do each day, is to repent of all the things that we love more than Christ and go to him. Now, you, you say, well, how do I? I just naturally enjoy this. <laughs> it doesn't take much to be able to enjoy fill in the blank. <laughs> but how do I learn to enjoy Christ? How do I learn to enjoy Christ? That is a process that God in the Bible and this church wants to teach you. I can't give that to you in one sentence, okay? That is a, that is a lifelong journey learning to enjoy Christ. So if you were looking for a one-sentence answer, sorry, you're not going to get it. But you will get it over time. You will learn to meet God where he wants to, where he's set up meetings in advance. I'll meet you at my word. I'll meet you there. I'll meet you in prayer. You get down on your knees, I'm going to be there. I'm going to meet you here at the communion table. Be there. I'm going to meet you in the fellowship of other believers when you get together with people during the week and you stoke the fire and encourage your faith, right? I'm going to meet you as you move out in service and start to use your spiritual gifts and start to look at helping other people, not just yourself. I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to, I'm going to grow you. And I'm going to teach you what it means to enjoy me above all things. It's to Jesus that you need to come for true riches. Isn't that what he's saying to the church in Laodicea here in Revelation? You think that you're rich, but you're not. <laughs> you think that you're rich, Americans, but you're not. You're really poor. And some people that you think are really poor are actually really rich. They're actually really rich because they have the good above all goods, they have the gift that is above every gift. See, at Christmas time, there, there is this wonderful tradition of giving gifts to one another, right? And as Christians, that comes from God giving us the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. 
And in church history, it also kind of dates back to the wise men bringing gifts to the Holy Family, right? And that's a good thing because it teaches us the lesson that Jesus taught his disciples. Truly, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive, right? We must come and learn these lessons from the Lord Jesus. I took my kids to the store uh, this weekend. Kelly's in Alabama visiting relatives and dad and kid hangout time this weekend. And so we decided we were going to go to the store and get some supplies and make up some little packets for the homeless down in Liberty Park and take them some Christmas presents. So we approached a group of five uh, people that were standing there, and my kids walked up to them with the presents. And, uh, you know, this one guy who was very high on drugs at the time looked at us and said, I just threw up over there. And then one of my kids handed him a Christmas present. And that is exactly how you are with God. You are high on drugs, you just threw up. God comes to you in your filth, and he gives you the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Boom! Not dependent on you at all. That's how salvation happens. Salvation is automatic. God's grace is automatic. It it is effective in itself without your help to change your life and to come in and to change everything and to bring you to himself. He gave you the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus, while you were still in your sins, while you were still in your filth. That's where he came to you, and that's where he met you. If someone asks you, when were you saved? You just tell them 2,000 years ago (laughs) on the cross. But then the Holy Spirit brought it to you, right? The Holy Spirit brought it to you at just the right time. And that changes everything. You you unwrap the gift and now you're rich. Now you're rich. You're truly rich, right? Not rich with the things that the world counts as rich. That's all just relative, right? I was teaching my kids uh, about a week ago about the value of money. And we talked about banks and how, you know, this idea there's supposed to be gold behind the money and stuff like that, which is a joke now, right? But, you know, that's the way it used to work, right? And in theory, you could open up, you know, sort of your own bank somewhere or whatever. or And someone could always bring the little note in and get their little piece of gold, right? And you sort of establish value that way. But it's all relative. It's all relative, right? You could, you could have, you know, crashed your ship onto a deserted island, which was, was already colonized. There was a group of 100 people who already lived there. And this island was just absolutely covered in diamonds throughout caves, throughout the island. Just covered. Just plenty of pure, wonderful diamonds. But in that economy, diamonds were completely worthless. You initially gathered up all you could in your pockets for when you were surely to be rescued, but you couldn't use them. It was like handing someone a a handful of dirt if you handed them a handful of diamonds for some food or whatever. It's all relative, right? Even, Even in our societies, even in our cultures, Value and money is all relative. But what is the ultimate standard? What is, shall we say, the gold standard? The gold standard is the things that the Lord values. The things that are eternal, which is what John says, whoever does the will of God abides forever. And you can only do the will of God when the will of God has been done in your life. You have received grace freely. Now, freely give. And that is the opposite of consumerism. That's the opposite. Consumerism is you worked for your money, and it's yours, doggone it, and you can use it however you want to. And you're gonna. (laughs) The Bible says the worker is worthy of his wages. There's a righteous principle that we take and we twist, right? But the opposite of that idolatry of consumerism and of spending your whole life on things that don't last, right? On things that don't last. The reverse and the opposite of this is receiving freely the grace of God and now giving it to other people, right? Giving it to other people. Moses was recently asking me, what's the fanciest hotel in the whole world? You know, And I told him, probably, I don't know, but probably something called the Ritz-Carlton that might have a room that you could pay, you know, 
$3,000 a night for, right? And he said, $3,000, you know? And I could tell his little brain was, you know, thinking through all the ways of $3,000. But I said, he said, who would, who would do that? I said, well, if you're a billionaire, that's just change in your pocket, right? It's, it's almost worthless to you. But you're spending that money on just one night. It's not going to last, right? You, you got to check out times at 11 a.m., right? <laughs> and it's gone. That's it. You just spent the $3,000 and check out times at 11. You got to go, you know? Check out time is age 70 for us. You have to go. But what are you going to take with you, eternally speaking? God's grasp of grace on your life is automatic, it is inescapable, it is effective. And once he gets a hold of you and he, he captures your heart, and you learn to willingly surrender to that capturing more and more each day, that's, that's the battle now, right? It's, it is a daily battle. You will cherish the good above all goods. And in that, you'll learn to, to give away everything. You'll learn to really enjoy giving away things to others. So three final suggestions to cherish Christ above consumer goods. This Christmas, try something. Attempt to give away more presents than you receive. Attempt to give away more presents than you receive. God the Father started it. The wise men advanced it. (laughs) And now we continue the tradition, right? It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is, sort of the, this is sort of what it looks like. This is the outcome of cherishing the gift of all gifts. Number two, beware. Be, be wary in your mind and beware of the sinister nature of consumerism. Um, again, it's so easy to get wrapped up, right? Uh, when you're shopping for someone else. And again, there's nothing sinful about buying yourself something or whatever. But it's a, heart, it's a heart attitude that often comes out, right? John Calvin once famously said, our hearts are factories of idols. <laughs> Boy, I can make up a new one next week. <laughs> something I never struggled with. I'll, I, can, I can invent something new to worship besides God next week. Just wait and see. Third and finally, as I often say, run. Don't walk. Run to Christ. And take from him gold, new clothes, the medicine that you need. He has it. He is our all in all. And when he fills you, there's no room left for the lusts of this world.